Alright, and the final story in Full Dark No Stars is A Good Marriage, which is another movie adaptation of King that kind of just went totally under the radar, and I don't remember it being released in, like, the 2014 area. I think it was October of 2014. Um, and I only heard of its existence maybe, like, a year ago, if that. Um, and it was like, oh, that exists, apparently. All right. Um, so it's, and it's easy to see why, um, that this would just kind of not make much of an impact at all and then just kind of fade into obscurity, um, which was actually kind of shocking when it was like, when you hear that, you think like, oh, it must have nobodies in it and nobody like in of great notice would have adapted it, um, in any way. Um, so it stars Joan Allen and Anthony LaPaglia two titans of acting, as well as Stephen Lang as Ramsey, and this was the first movie since Pet Cemetery, if we're not counting miniseries or TV movies or anything like that, that King adapted himself. He, he wrote the script himself um, from his own story, and because in between he did stuff like, you know, The Shining miniseries, all those miniseries like that. Um, and he did like his own original scripts like uh, Sleepwalkers and The Golden Years and all that stuff. Um, so it's, it was strange to think like how much was behind this. And it's like, why, if this didn't work, why didn't it work? Um, or why didn't it at least leave enough of a lasting impact to know that it exists um, so, uh, when you watch it, um, you can kind of get where it might seem a bit botched. Though, much like what we've been talking about, it's weird how you can adapt it pretty faithfully and yet still not come out on the right side of it somehow. Um, so we can jump into that. Um, obviously this is King's sort of somewhat take on the BTK, uh, killer, which was actually the inspiration for a movie that came out like four years after A Good Marriage, um, The Clove Hitch Killer with Dylan McDermott, which is really fucking good. <laughs> um, and creepy as hell. Um, and like I said, feels so grounded in a particular reality that it feels like it's not just like vaguely based on BTK, but like it feels like it's its own true story, um, even though it's not. Um, and so I would definitely, if you want, like, if you want something like this, I'd definitely seek out the Clovich Killer instead. <laughs> um, but, um, and apparently it was also, um, it was BTK's daughter, I think, was, like, really upset with this. Um, not just the movie, but the story itself, because she thought it, like, sort of basically gave him a spotlight. Um, and it was double that because apparently he's a huge King fan, so it was almost like, almost like fan service to him for King to write this story, which I'm definitely going to assume King did not by any means, uh, was, did not go in with that intention at all. Um, but, uh, so that's kind of an unfortunate, uh, side thing going into this, but as far as the story and the movie itself... Um, it's, I guess it's, what's interesting about this story is how small it feels in the sense of, because if you're talking about, if you're talking about adapting it into like a cinematic movie, what's interesting about the story is how few characters are in it and how small it feels and almost like sort of one location it feels to where I feel like this would make a really good play. And all you would need is one set and three actors. Um, and w the two of them with Ramsey coming in at the end. Um, ver very much like Sleuth, uh, pretty much. So, or, you know, as far as movies go, recognizable chamber pieces like uh, Death on the Maiden or something like that. Um, because in the story, pretty much the only two characters in it are uh, Bob and Darcy prior to Bob's death, before Ramsey comes into it. So, and they talk, they mention their kids, and they talk to their kids on the phone and stuff like that, but for the most part, the focus is just on the two of them, where the first part, you can really just break it down into three parts, where it's the first part, where Darcy finds out everything, um, and then he comes in and realizes that she knows. Then there's the second part here, where... It, they they try to go along with the marriage, but ultimately it ends with her killing him and trying to cover that up. 
And then the last bit would be Ramsey's introduction and then coming into the story and then that whole dialogue. And that's all you need. Um, so the fact that this movie is breaks an hour 40 feels like it's already going to be overkill. Um, and the fact that you've got all the side characters, you've got like their friends at the party at the beginning, and then their kids kind of come in and out of the story and all that. Um, I mean, I can kind of see where that might seem necessary in the middle portion, where it's like, it seems like she's just trying to get her normal life back, um, with those things ultimately creeping in, like, you know, maybe I should, if, if I stop him, you know, will that ease my mind about the fact that he may still be going out there and killing people? Um, and will he or will he not ultimately come after me, even though he claims he won't, convincingly claims that he won't. Um, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of things here that can be explored without having to go out of the confines of the very small setup that we have. Um, and the fact that you have such capable actors, all three of them, um, there's, you could have really very easily made this something worthwhile, but... It kind of went in almost a predictable direction in regards to you. You'd imagine like they won't. They they're probably not going to take that route. They're probably not going to make this as small as possible. They're going to stretch it out because they feel like if they're making a movie, it has to be bigger than the story, which isn't really necessarily the case always. Um, especially when you're the, it's so it's such a character driven like story. Um, and like I said, you, as far as Alan and Paul go, there's there's been a trend um, in talking about these novellas, and it's like regardless of the quality of the movies, the casting is almost always completely spot on, um, and that is absolutely the case here, especially Lapalia, who is like just an amazing actor in general. He is one of those actors that's like always been there, but like so rarely gotten like his due. Um, he is so consistently great, uh, like all the time. And jo Joan Allen's basically a legend. Um, but what kind of sucks here is that LaPaglia gets the perfect stuff to work with. Like, he knows exactly what to do with the material that he's given. And Joan Allen kind of gets the shit into the stick because of the way the movie wants to portray Darcy, which kind of deviates from the story. And no normally I would say, like, you don't necessarily have to 150% faithfully portray the character. Like, I'm not saying the character's portrayal in the movie is bad just because it's not the book's version. Um, it's the fact that, well, number one, the book's version just works so well, um, but also works well, like, dramatically. Like, the moment, like, the, the big thing that, like, really completely defines what I'm talking about is the scene where she kills him. Because... You have the moment when she he's obviously already gone down the stairs, but then she has to smother him. And in this, mo this moment where she smothers him is two completely different moments from story to movie. Um, where in the story, she's almost meek about it, but knows what she has to do, but she's like crying through the whole thing. Um, and in the movie, it's almost vengeful. Which is weird, because it gives her a specific motive in the book. In the book, it says, that there's this whole other thing about, um, on top of all the women he's killed, there was a child that got involved in one of the murders, and he had to kill the child also. He had, in his mind, to kill the child. And that's what really took her to the darkest of the dark places, and made her realize, I'm going to kill him. And, but it was still such a bizarre deviation from my life was absolutely perfect for nearly 20 years uh, <laughs> and then it's come to this point so suddenly um, like her, like when you look at the whole picture of their marriage it's her finding out what he is, having those conversations with him and it's like the um, will she or will she not act on this um, and then ultimately killing him, it all, everything in that point happens so quickly. Like, her life has been so turned upside down in, in a completely different path, and this dark, hideous world that she never even thought could probably exist is now her own life. Um, and in, in, the, like, in the movie, um, she just seems vengeful in general. Um, like, because, because you're a piece of shit. Because you are a killer in general. Not necessarily one specific victim, like, pushed it to the edge, because obviously all of them did, but there was that one, just the inclusion of the child was enough uh, to get her to that point, that she said in her mind, he needs to go and I need to do it because I'm the only one that can. 
um, because I'm the only one that knows as, as far as this, this far. Um, and I'm in the vicinity enough to be able to pull it off. And in, in the movie, there's almost a recklessness about how, like, viciously she does it. Um, and it just feels like such a different path for the character, which sucks because that's, like, the impact of her killing him in the story is she has such the warmth of, you know, the wife and mother role in the story, and that's a role that Joan Allen can do to perfection. I mean, if nothing else, see Pleasantville, um, among many other things. And it's like, there's so many things that Joan Allen can do, um, whether it be tough or this kind of role, and she can r really get to a point here that would have been perfect for the portrayal of this character. And for some reason, the movie seems not want to really go in that direction with her, or at least it didn't, it didn't portray her, or it didn't focus enough on her portrayal to really show us one side of her or another. Um, she just kind of reacts to, yeah, my husband's a serial killer, and then it's doesn't really give her enough of kind of a focus on this um, to see, like, a change in character. We get these cheap suspense moments, suspense in quotes, when she's, like, picturing, like, oh, this is, he's under the car, I can just kill him now. Um, or she keeps, she keeps having, like, nightmares and visions of him attacking her or other things that he may or may not be doing. Um, and it's like, I, I get if they want to kind of maybe play around with that a little bit, but they do it in just the most cheap and obvious ways, um, that it's just totally suspenseless. Um, until she, until the abrupt moment where she finally just does it. Um, and then when she does do it, it's like, that would be a really big moment. Um, but with all of the fake-out moments on top of the way that she does it, um, there's just nothing really shocking about it in the way that it should be, especially coming from this character, but, uh, that's pretty much just how the portrayal ended up. Um, but they do seem to try to throw in some other things here, like, um, like, it's hard to tell where, like, where the direction stops and where it's King almost sabotaging his own story, but that's also the thing to where it's like, is this exactly how King wanted to adapt it, or is there somebody behind the scenes saying, hey, we're making a movie, when you adapt it, you should do these things. And so King just has to because it's part of the job. That could be the case, um, certainly. Um, and I definitely, for sure, want to give King the benefit of the doubt, <laughs> just, just from within. But, um, they do have some of these moments that they throw in, like, the fact that in the story, obviously, everything is set up by the fact that she needs batteries, um, because the remote's dead, so she goes looking for them, but the thing that they do to kind of set up what it is that's about to happen, or to set, to foreshadow the turn that's about to happen, is the movie that's on TV is like this sort of gore fest where this girl's tied down and getting stabbed. Um, and she has like this really revolved reaction to it. Like it's the most terrible thing she's ever seen. Once again, so far away from her life as of now. Um, not realizing what is in her future. Um, and I l kind of like that. It's very on the nose. But I do kind of like that in the sense of... It's basically her being confronted with this, and it's, like I said, very on the nose, quite literally out of her control, to where, like, she is being faced with this horrific violence, and she can't do anything to stop it, because the remotes and batteries are dead. Um, just like when it gets to her, her real life is about to have a turn where she realizes she's being confronted with this violence, and there's not really anything she can do about it until she does something about it. Um, so... Yeah, moments like that, I suppose, are nice little additions to that. Um, but you also get um, the way they portray Ramsey's character. We are introduced to Ramsey's character, not in the last moments of the story, but in, like, the first minute. And I don't mean minute as in, like, a vague amount of time. I mean 60 seconds <laughs> into the movie. Um, he's there at the party, just hanging out. And he's kind of just stalking around, and... I was. You, this is the point where you got to put yourself in the perspective of somebody that hasn't read the story. It's like, how would somebody that hasn't read the story be viewing this at this particular moment? And I, I kind of like that they keep him mysterious enough, assuming people who haven't read the story will take it this way, that we don't know really what it is that Ramsey, who he is or what he's doing and why. 
Um, because we get the seed planted that BD exists and is out there killing people because he's got the newspaper article in front of him. But with that alone, somebody who doesn't know the story could think Stephen Lang's playing somebody that's, like, maybe watching him for any particular reason. Maybe it's somebody that knew a victim and is vengeful or something, or, like, no, knows exactly who he is and is going to blackmail him or something like that. It could be really anything when somebody's being stalked around by a character we don't know whose purpose uh, they have. Um, but, of course, when you do know, um, it's... It's just like, wow, they're introducing him way early. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so... And another thing that I think, if I'm remembering correctly, is different from story to movie, that's really effective in the movie, um, and that is not just because Anthony Navalia is awesome, his performance is awesome, but the scene when he comes home in the middle of the night, and he's like, well, I know that you know, so let's just talk about this. It doesn't matter how late it is. Um, just talk about this as if we're husband and wife and nothing has happened between us at all. If so, everything's the same. Um, if I remember correctly, in the story, he's just, like, sitting next to her and talking to her about this and all the, all of the details and where it came from, the backstory about him and his old friend who the initials BD come from, um, which I think in the, in the movie it's more on the lines of he and his friend were gonna do stuff like this, where in the, in the story they're talking about, like, building up to a school shooting. Um, e either way, they were always insane. Um... And in the movie, as he's explaining this, he actually gets under the covers with her, just while casually talking, as if he's casually talking about his day. He just gets under the covers with her <laughs> and just keeps talking about this. I thought that was such a confronting thing for this character. Um, because it goes into the whole thing of like, uh, oh, I know this secret and now I have to share a bed with him. But it's like, the way the movie went after her, she's already sharing the bed with him as she's learning more details. Um, makes it so much creepier. Um, so I do like that. Um, and while we're on the subject of their marriage, it is interesting how many, um, because obviously the first story in Full Darkness Stars is 1922, and then we end on a good marriage, so they're like, on the ends. Um, and even though the stories are, like, totally different settings and different stories, um, there's so many parallels between them, which I find interesting. Um, like, we've already talked about the whole duality of it. Like, there's, um, like, we talked about it in 1922, Big Driver, and here, it's kind of both characters. Um, with, uh, Bob in the sense that one version of him is Bob and one of is BD, obviously. Um, and it's interesting, BD can also stand for Big Driver, if you want to take that route. <laughs> um, but then there's also Darcy, and we start off with Darcy having two different sides of what she calls Smart Darcy and Stupid Darcy. Um, and that's one aspect, but then there's the whole other aspect of after she's killed Bob, and, it's, and then it kind of becomes similar to Big Driver in a way, as far as the duality uh, thing kind of goes. Um, but then there is also, um, how it's kind of the opposite of 1922, what kind of being in the same way, where it's, um, like the, <laughs> in a number of ways. For starters, you could say when, um, how 1922 is a movie that, or a story, or movie, that's set off with, uh, a man killing his wife. And that's the setting, setting off point. Um, whereas in this one, the wife is certainly in danger, because the husband's dangerous, but one of the first things he says is, well, I wouldn't kill you. Um, like, don't, don't worry about that. I wouldn't let BD get to you, even though that is also me. Um, <laughs> but then there's also um, the reverse factor of it ends up being the wife that kills the husband rather than the husband that kills the wife. And I think I feel like, that, I feel like that's kind of an interesting flip in regards to the first story in the book versus the last story in the book and how it almost kind of comes full circle in this weird way, despite the fact that the stories themselves don't really have that much in common when you look at just those little moments like that that are actually large portions of it it's it starts to kind of connect in this interesting way the whole book kind of feels like they have those weird connections despite all the stories being so different um which is great um so then we also get to another interesting point that the movie goes in that i don't think the story did also talking about bd um the conclusion that ramsey comes to about bd also being bob and darcy um, and it's like, it's so obvious, I don't know if it's something King already had in mind, um, when he wrote it, and it just wasn't, like, a big factor, um, or it was, like, 
he it, 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 like it was he knew he had it in his mind and he knew it was like this if, if we're doing the movie adaptation that would obviously have to come up to the point that there's this whole other thing where Ramsey comes to the conclusion that both of them um, are widely involved because obviously the story stems from um, King talks about in the afterward about how there was that whole thing where once BTK was outed it was like how would his wife have possibly not known um, and to kind of do that whole thing here with this Ramsey segment um, adds a nice little sort of final act uh, to this story rather than the final act being a confrontation between them because he even straight up says you know this isn't the story or the movie where the husband chases the wife around the house and it turns out that it isn't um, miraculously <laughs> um, and it's uh, once again adaptations tend to take their liberties I'm almost surprised I'm almost surprised how faithful the adaptation actually is so there's that um, but um, yeah I but I do think um, you can tell where they're really stretching it uh, these moments where like especially when it gets how like it's it really I can just I can imagine it absolutely being cinematic even as like a small chamber thing where it's like just Ramsey and Darcy having a very long conversation um, that goes the way that it does in the story. And another thing I'm really surprised they kept in is uh, the reference to Shawshank that Ramsey makes. It's like, you, usually the adaptations take out the in-universe references, but uh, that one somehow managed to still be intact. Um, but they do this whole thing where Ramsey ends up going to the hospital, and then she goes to see him, and that's where their final scene is, before we have the payoff with the candy in the final scene. And it's like, him saying you did the right thing and just leaving is such a perfect ending. You did not need to touch that. <laughs> it's like we talked about we talked about um, Shawshank and we talked about you know Big Driver we talked about 1922 where all the endings are slightly differed um, for various reasons and it's like I can see why you did one and I can see why this was the other way. And I get it. But I cannot see where it's okay to end this story on anything but Ramsey whispering to her you did the right thing and leaving. Um, and it's and it's a powerful moment in the movie also, even though they dragged out for two scenes for some reason. Um, and the fact that it seems to be Ramsey's like more or less dying moments, I guess they wanted to make it more dramatic. Um, but it was it was dramatic as is. <laughs> That's all it took. Um, so I can't really get behind that the way I've gotten behind other, okay, I can see why you did this for the ending and kind of changed it from what King initially had, which is really weird <laughs> because King adapted it. So I don't know what's happening here. Uh, like, like I said, maybe these were studio calls that he just had to go along with to get the money. I don't know, but, <laughs> but you know, I, I don't know, but, um, so yes, um, certainly a weaker adaptation, uh, given what all we've been talking about. Um, but like I said, sometimes we've got really strong adaptations like 1922, um, then some middle ground ones like uh, Big Driver, and then you've got A Good Marriage, which isn't a terrible movie. There are certainly points that I've mentioned um, that are really great, like, you know, individual choices that go away from the story. Um, but it's overall, that's just so, you can see how this story would translate really well to screen. Um, even really as like, I, I can probably see it as a short, um, but I mainly stand by, I could really definitely absolutely see it as a play. Um, but this movie is what we have as of now, so, and like I said, it just kind of came and went, and I don't think a lot of people even know it's out there despite the fact that you have names like Joan Allen and Anthony Napoli at the top of it. So, however that happened. But, um, I think that's going to conclude Full Dark No Stars, so we are going to end this next week on me and my brother talking about Secret Window, uh, going back to Four Past Midnight. And then that'll be it. And then that should be about the end of October as well, or near there. Um, there'll probably just be like a couple more verses left after that, and then that'll be it. Um, so until those, I think, uh, that's it for this.